I like sharing what I'm doing and the idea that that could be marketing was very exciting to me. Like I would do it anyway, even if, if it wasn't marketing. Mm. Um, but no one had done it in beer in Australia. So like we were researching and talking to people about how to start a brewery. We were told it would cost a million dollars. There was no content out there. So we set about, I started a podcast, we started an Instagram channel, we started a blog, we wrote, I wrote a book about how to build a brewery. We actually finished the book before we'd even built the brewery. <laughs> it was unique, like pe people hadn't done that before. And now in Australia, if you Google anything to do with starting a brewery or you know building a portable bar or um, how much does craft beer cost, then our website comes up first every time. This is an intro. Intro, intro, intro. Hustle and flow chart with your boy, my boy, Matt Wolf and Joe Fair. Hey. Welcome back to the Hustle and Flow Chart podcast. We're back and we're together in an intro. It's been too long, so we're yeah. missing each other. <laughs> this episode, we spent some more time with each other, so don't worry. We'll be together in the episode too. All right. We have a new friend of ours and... Uh, I think you're going to be a friend of his after this episode as, as well. His name is Dan Norris, and uh, this guy has done a lot in, I would say, a pretty short period of time, and he's doing it in a creative way. Mm -hmm. So his approach to marketing is, is, I don't know, I just feel like I jive with it. I like it. It's a yeah. lot of what we do, but he's really distilled it into something that really makes sense. Yeah. Well, he really uh, focuses on four core pillars, right? He focuses on branding, storytelling, community, and content marketing. And I would say that this episode, we kind of deep dive into really all four of those. Mm -hmm. We do. Yeah. So he's the founder of WP Curve. And that was back in, what, 2013. He actually ended up scaling that. And we'll talk about a little bit how he did that using this model. But he actually ended up selling it to GoDaddy back in the day. And that opened the doors to his new venture, which is Black Hops Brewing out there in Australia. And he told us on the episode, it's actually rated or voted the number one craft beer brewery in, in australia, australia. I was yeah. like, damn that's cool so i mean he's he's learned everything in this sandbox of internet marketing but he's just applied it now to this other fun venture in a brewery form so i mean i don't know how further apart those things are in yeah. terms but like obviously they're very similar too so i think yeah. you're gonna get a lot from well there's a one. similar thread in the way he marketed them because the marketing that he's going to teach you on this episode works for both Dang, so right? you're going to want the notes on this one you can go get the notes over at flowchartgroup.com if you go to flowchartgroup.com it will ask you to join our facebook group by joining the facebook group you'll also most likely give us your email address and by giving us your email address we'll send you the notes that sounded like a really sort of long answer but go to flowchartgroup.com you'll end up on our facebook group and you'll be able to get the action guide for this episode if you do it within two weeks all right his ow his ow let's go talk to dan norris all right dan I want to get some of your beer, man. Ship some over here. <laughs> Thanks for joining actually, us. Actually, we, we just got a, this is funny, actually. I got a, a mate of mine, Sam, who's one of our investors, but he's like super nice and he like he lives in Thailand um, and he's he doesn't get a lot of our beer because we don't export it. And he just sent an email to our admin email address and just went like, oh, I'm a big fan of Black Ops. I was wondering if you guys could send me some beer and I'm happy to pay for it. But like, instead of asking me, because he knows I'll send it to him for free. Uh, <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> I know. But yeah, our beer is actually pretty hard to get overseas. So I yeah. Yeah, might not be able to help you with that one. Yeah, no, I know. <laughs> I figured as much. But when we're over there, we'll, we'll make a stop by. You yeah. got plenty of beer in San Diego. You, you're doing just fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, Black Hops is probably my favorite brewery name I've ever heard. That's just such a, a cool name <laughs> for a brewery. <laughs> Yeah, I thought it was weird. Like when this is years ago now, but when me and Eddie were m messaging back and forth about the name, like we just came up with so many shit names. <laughs> like every single option was shit, and we were both sending shit options. Um, and then he sent he sent Black Ops, and then he sent like three or four others. And I was like, wait, Black Ops is awesome. Is has no one taken that yet? And then we looked around and no one had taken. I'm like, how has no one taken this name? This is that's a great crazy. Name. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's the best. And then you pair it up with all the other stuff. So. Um, yeah, let's let's definitely come back to the beer stuff. You know, once we kind of get into the back journey with with how you kind of got started and all this stuff, because like we we're riffing a lot of this, what you've applied now or what you do apply now in the beer industry, you got from internet marketing and doing a lot of this kind of stuff here. So it's yeah. it's uh it's gonna be fun. So I think taking us back, like I know WP Curve was kind of the kind of the thing that really launched you into this space and but you did it in a very smart way you know obviously using compound marketing which is your new book that's out and definitely 
definitely get it. I love it because like you start out and you're like, I have no agenda. There's no upsells, no bullshit. Like I got nothing to sell you other than some beer if you want it. <laughs> so. I can't even sell that because most of your audience is probably in America. Good point. Yeah, but, yeah. I don't know. We have a lot of Australians actually, so you'd be surprised. So. <laughs> okay. Well, if that's the case, yeah, for 100%, you should buy the beer. <laughs> <laughs> well. Well, cool. Well, why don't you take us back? How did how did you get into like the internet marketing world, and then how did it eventually get into beer? Yeah. Well, you you mentioned just before we we're chatting, James Shramko was the person who suggested I come on this show. Um, I was just kind of, you know, I started my own business when I was twenty six. I think this is four, fifteen years ago, fourteen and a half years ago now. Um, just because I didn't like working for other people for literally no other reason. I didn't see like an opportunity. I like, wasn't an entrepreneur. I just didn't want to have a job. That was the only reason. Mm -hmm. um, and I started building websites only because I just kind of got excited about technology and I, I just buy these like Sam's Teach Yourself books. I was in, in human resources. I, I didn't even have a job in IT, wow. um, but I just liked it. So I'm like, okay, I'm just going to start a business building websites. And I did that for seven years. It, it, it really never went very well. I didn't know what I was doing, but... I did enjoy kind of getting into some of the content, like the kind of stuff you guys do back then. It was actually pretty hard to find a lot of that stuff. Like mm -hmm. I gradually discovered it after years and discovered groups like James's and the Dynamite Circle and podcasts like you mentioned, Pat Flynn and mm -hmm. guys like that eventually. But when I started, there just really, there either wasn't that kind of thing or was just really in its infancy. And, and a lot mm -hmm. of the internet marketing stuff was really salesy and, just like a competition for who could make the shittest looking website that converted the highest and that yeah. kind of stuff. W uh, what warrior forum days. I don't know if you warrior know. forum. Yeah, that was yeah. it. The war room and all of that. Yep. Um, so I was never really into that stuff. That stuff always kind of rubbed me the wrong way. Hmm. But at the same time, I liked I liked the online space and I, I learned a lot from guys like James and Pat Flynn and, and people like that. Uh, and there, there were many others. Um, so, I, yeah, so I kind of just eventually that business didn't really work out. I tried a bunch of other things and eventually fell on this idea out of desperation of doing WordPress support with WP Curve. And, and dur during – and it, it, it was – A, it was a good business, but B, the way – which I kind of realised later, the way I marketed that business was all sort of based around the, my story and doing a lot of content and building a really good brand and all that kind of stuff which was sort of like a, a way of marketing that I'd fallen in love with, I suppose. And something that I didn't learn at university it was just kind of like I was just stumbling through it. <laughs> and it wasn't really until last year when I kind of put it all together and thought, actually, I've been doing this form of marketing for many years and I've, I'm actually quite successful at it now. <laughs> um, so why don't I write a book about it? Um, but yeah, the, the WP curve was quite good. Uh, after a couple of years, we sold it to GoDaddy and mm -hmm. at exactly the same time, we opened a brewery, which was just, <laughs> I was just a part-time, I was just doing it for fun, purely yeah. for fun. And, uh, but now it's just turned into this massive thing and, and this is what I do full-time and we've got 60 staff and yeah. That's rad, man. And I, so yeah, there's a lot to pick up here. So, uh, all the way back to, you know, studying guys like James and Pat. Like I know we've we've studied Pat for a long time. I mean, kind of he's San Diego guy as well. So we've kind of run in similar circles. But James probably been the last what four years or so. We've been really pretty tight with him three four years. I just yeah. wish it was way earlier. We were like really because <laughs> like it, it's it's a different way of thinking about people and like I know when you talk about brands and stories, it's a lot of subconscious stuff going on. You know, it's not just how you're making things look or how persuasive is your news you know your sales letter or some other stuff that everybody thinks it's important it's like there's a lot of this subconscious stuff that's really layered throughout all yeah, your marketing well, yeah. that's what i liked about james i liked his and and a lot of the stuff that got me into and and again this is something i realized afterwards not at the time but what i really liked about him was his story mm -hmm. and and he had like he had a lot of great he's got an amazing amount of content as well he's just he's a machine yeah mm -hmm. but in reflecting of what kind of attracted me to what he does was, you know, his story about, you know, being a car salesman, working his way up and, um, you know, trying to build a, a income away from work to match his income and all that kind of stuff, yeah. which, which was all true. It wasn't, you know, and, and and whether it was marketing for him at the time, I don't even know. I've never asked him, mm -hmm. but he's, he's a good storyteller and he's good with, uh, you know, metaphors and, helping people understand things and he's, he's a straight shooter. So that, that stuff I liked. I think with a lot of these things, it's about picking up the bits that suit you and that's kind of what took me a long time but eventually I kind of figured out that 
you know, the Pat Flynn approach, a lot of that doesn't work for me. The James mm-hmm. Shramko approach, a lot of that doesn't work for me, but bits of it do. And then, mm-hmm. you know, the really heavy marketing, heavy paid ads approach doesn't work for me. Um, but then the, you know, the, the branding design startup stuff does and the content, like just producing a lot of content on different platforms is something I just fell in love with. So you're just kind of taking the bits that work for you and melding it into your own approach. And that's that's what I found works well. And I think I think with guys like James, he's taken, that's what he's done. He's taken a lot of really sort of high level sales um, conversion, hmm. copywriting stuff from, John, you know, John Carlton and these, these kind of guys um, and, you know, all the, the kind of the business guys he, he talks about all the time, all the, all the books, yeah. but then he's applied it to the online space and, and added storytelling and metaphors and all this kind of stuff to come up with his own kind of brand that yeah. is kind of unique to him. Um, and, yeah, that, I think that's the way to go. That's what I feel like I've done with things like design because I think design is not something that was heavily prioritised in any of the online marketing stuff that I saw, but it was – in the startup world and I really kind of fell in love with the startup world and took that design element and content mm-hmm. community building is a big thing with the on with the online which is not a big thing with traditional businesses so that's a bit that I've kind of brought across to a traditional business yeah. um, and then content was just a, a something I enjoyed doing and realized that it could also be marketing yeah very cool I, I'm, I'm, this is just for my own kind of curiosity but with, with WP curve I was actually a customer of WP curve back in 2012 or somewhere around there Mm -hmm. Um, we had a company called learn to blog and and wp curve was our service to help manage our own blog that we had that taught people how to blog but anyway (laughs) i'm curious uh wp curve how how did it get its initial traction like what what sort of marketing did you do to actually get it on people's radar in the beginning if you weren't doing paid ads and things like that yeah. So, well, firstly, thank you for being a customer. That, that means a lot because it because um that you know that without WP Curve, I would have absolutely nothing of what I've done since. Um, how did we get traction? So, so, and this is again re- reflecting when I wrote this book was like all the stuff I did then is the stuff I'm doing now. Mm-hmm. But it was just by accident. It was a fluke. So, so what happened with WP Curve was I was telling. I was telling my I was doing monthly reports on my blog, very much Pat Flynn. You mm-hmm. know, he kind of pioneered the concept. Mm-hmm. I was doing the same thing, income reports. Um, but my because of the startup I was working on was just failing. Like I had no income. So that like I kind of joke when I was doing public speaking that they were more just reports, not <laughs> income reports. Because um, <laughs> I didn't have any income. Yeah. But it, but I realized I employed a guy called Kyle um who who um I'm just thinking, I think at one point he like read one of those reports and then it was it was when it was taking off and um, he's like, oh, you're, you're, the arc of your kind of income report looks exactly like the story arc from Cinderella. And I don't even know what a story arc was, but it that was kind of like a, a um, penny drop moment because I realised that a lot of these people have been following this story of this entrepreneur who was kind of in forums and active and failing really badly. And then WP curve took off and then they followed the story way more because then it was way more interesting. Um, And I'd I'd sort of built it without knowing through that storytelling aspect. Um, But the other part of it was the community part of it, which was uh, forums like James Shramko's and the Dynamite Circle. Those two forums were the only places I marketed that business Mm. um, before it launched. So I, so I launched it in the DC. It was only available to people in the DC um, for the first week. And then I did the same thing in James's forum. And, you know, I got 10, 15 customers and they were the people that were sharing the content and reading the, co- the content and whatnot. And then I just kept getting them uh, every week, every month and built up a team from there. So it's, I think at one point we experimented with paid ads. We spent $23 I think, and then and then we just switch it off. I love so, that you remember that number. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, yeah. so we wrote a blog post about it, of course. And unfortunately, yeah. none of the content's available anymore, so I guess that's a bit of a lesson as well. But yeah, we I learned very quickly that I wasn't good at paid ads, but there's there's another approach that worked perfectly well, yeah. and we just grew it organically through content community, and also investing in the brand, having a good name. We spent a lot of money on the website. It was the fastest loading website in the industry. It was the best looking website. Um, the brand looked really sharp and it, it, you know, I think it stood out from the kind of sea of competitors that came after mm. I started. Yeah. Now I'm kind of curious because 
actually forum marketing is so damn good. I mean, that's where a lot of our marketing kind of started, you know, in, in small, small doses there, like warrior form days was one of them. But uh, like, how would you go about in say James's community? Cause that's a paid community. Obviously it's a no yep. pitch kind of thing. Like how would you approach a community, someone else's community like that and still, you know, give value and not look like the guy that's like, "Hey, buy my shit, kind of guy." <laughs> yeah, well, I wouldn't. That's the thing. It it, it, it didn't it, it didn't ever happen in that way. And, and the Dynamite Circle was a paid community as well. Mm-hmm. But but this was a legitimate community that I was a part of. I'd been to their first uh, physical conference in well, i have been to their first physical startup event in the Philippines, and then a few months later, their first physical conference in Bangkok, which they've subsequently subsequently done every year until last year. Um, and I was very active in the forum and all these guys knew what I was doing. We were all kind of rooting for each other. It wasn't, it wasn't like I was going into this forum saying, here's my business, buy my shit. It wasn't mm-hmm. like that at all. It was like, this is what I'm doing. Um, in, in that particular case, there wasn't like, there, there is an offers section in the community, but it's not, it's not like the warrior forum. It, right. It's, you know, yeah. it's, a, it's a paid community. It's a great group of people. And it was, it was more like, you know, if you think this is useful, sign up and you'll get a discount. Um, mm-hmm. I, I, to, to be honest, I, I've never seen forum marketing as something that's up my alley at all. It was just legitimately part of these communities and it grew organically from within them. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's like a, it's almost like a storytelling and you're, yeah, it's the value. It's You have the first impression in design and a unique product or some kind of service you can offer. But I mean, yeah, yeah. that's in a community like that where you have paid members people that trust the collective i guess in that community it's an amazing way to get something off the ground without paid traffic or some other means yeah the, i mean the the I, i'm not really in, and and i kind of struggle with forums just the structure of them they just seem so inefficient for me mm-hmm. to get my head around but i'm not really in in any other groups anymore but um you know i've seen other people do it in faith like i've i've had a facebook group over the years and it's the topic is around starting businesses. So people are going in there, starting things all the time, getting feedback on those things. And as long as it's legitimately, you know, you do actually want feedback on something, I think all of that is fine. But if you're going in and just like being signed up for my service or you're just doing it because you want people to sign up for your service, it's probably not the way to go. People can see yeah. through that pretty easily, I think. Yeah. Well, I know in the WP curve part, uh, uh, part of your book, it was talking about, you know, it's essentially compounding assets and, um, you know, you're, just uh, you know the marketing in general, but I I like the goal that you had from the get go, which was you know get profitable quickly. But really, it's only just sign up one new customer per month. I think it was like grow ten percent per month, right? And then just yeah. compound that. And what you're a million dollar company within I think it was two and a half years or something like that. Yeah, it's and it's funny because like back then, I remember at one point in my entrepreneurial journey, I set this like goal, which I thought was super aggressive which was, I actually, I read that Think and Grow Rich book and, I, and it's like, just say what you want and then you'll get it. I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, fuck yeah, I'm going to do this. <laughs> um, <laughs> that easy? <laughs> yeah. It is. And, <laughs> and I said, and the amount I said was $100,000. So I wanted my, and I'd been in business for, I'd been in business for two years and, I, and the amount I said was $100,000 revenue uh-huh. for my business. And um, it just seemed like such a large number. Like I didn't really understand how I would pull in that much money. And, you know, years on our businesses doing over a million dollars a month Mm -hmm. and like the numbers just go up. (laughs) That's that's great. (laughs) It just, it it just, it, it it turns from, you know, with growth, like this business, the the brewery business has grown doubled every single year. So it's grown, um, you know, as fast as any business, as you would want any business to grow. Even with COVID and pandemic type life and all that. Wow. That's cool. Yeah. And, um, you know, if, if you get, if you start at a million dollars revenue and you're doubling every year, these numbers get pretty bloody high. Mm-hmm. So you, yeah. that's that's the thinking you've always had then. Yeah, all the way from WP uh, curve days, just slow incremental compounded growth. And so like on the yeah. brew business, how do you how do you apply that thinking now to, you know, black hops and making sure that's always compounding? Yeah, well, I mean, to some extent, it's out of your hands, um, but like like our again with this business we spend way more time managing supply than we do managing demand like we've got very healthy demand for our products we don't advertise you know we we do no paid ads our, our marketing spend is less than one half of one percent of our turnover <laughs> and most most businesses we're competing with are above ten percent so that they're a hundred times what we're spending um and our the spend that we put into marketing is not 
it's not like paid ads that are optional. It's shit we actually need. It's like it's like signs to go up in bottle shops and stuff like that, which you yeah. can't really avoid. Um, so we've got a healthy demand for what we're doing. And I think we've built that because we've got a great story. We've invested a lot in the brand. And I go into that in the book mm-hmm. quite a bit. It's, you know, it's not just having a good logo. Like we've done 200 different beers over six years and we do 50, we do one different beer a week. A lot of those have been their own fully branded can that looks amazing. A lot of them have had professional photos. A lot of them have gone on to, you know, Instagram and blown up because of how they look. And some of these beers only last two hours and they're gone. Wow. So, like, this <laughs> investment in the brand is something that we're doing all the time. Um, and having a great product and being at the right time in the industry and all of that kind of stuff, being transparent about what we're doing and having a unique marketing angle, which to me is just a not really a marketing angle. It's just a unique way of doing business, which is basically taking the Pat Flynn approach and applying it to a brewery. Pretty much. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. And and no one had done it before. Like like we we well not well actually Brewdog were doing it very well, but no one had done it in Australia before. Brewdog. I, I know that sounds is that a in the States? Uh, yeah, they are. They've got they've got they've got a hundred bars, four breweries around the world. They've got uh, this hotel in Columbus, I think, where you can like have a bath with beer in it. And <laughs> all I love it. See, there's, there's a story right That's there. I'm, I'm surprised I've never heard of that <laughs> I brewery. I'm like I, I, I thought, I thought brewery, we were yeah, they're like in. the kings of. They, they kind of pioneered equity crowdfunding. That a TV show that we used to watch. They're the, the kind of kings of this uh, approach in the craft beer world. But no one had done it in Australia. Brewdog are actually here now, hmm. which is cool. Yeah. Um, but like when we, like the way I think about it was remember the um, the kind of Marcus Sheridan story about his river pools and spas. That was like mm. a story. Did you know the I've Marcus heard, Sheridan? I've heard of it, but I don't know the whole story. I mean, if you want to, if right. it's relevant here, yeah, I'd love to hear it. Yeah. So he he was. It was just one of these stories that kept coming up when people talked about content marketing. And his story was he was in a very traditional business selling pools. Mm-hmm. And he was just, you know, everyone's going around knocking door, door to door and it was just a major hustle and instead of doing, and, and everyone was very secretive about the information. So one perfect example was like how much does a pool cost? Mm-hmm. Like like even now in Australia, I'm sure if I go and how much does a pool cost, there's no companies writing content on this. It's yeah. people discussing it in forums. <clears throat> and he saw that as he kind of took what I call in another one of my books, The Leap of Faith, which is like, I'm going to give away all this information and it is a risk to do that because you're going to empower all of your competitors, you're going to give away all your trade secrets and that's not a no-lose thing to do. But if it works, the upside is huge and you're going to get smashed with a whole bunch of leads because you're going to be the people that come up when people are researching all the buying decisions. And and in his case, I think it was a lot of Google and local stuff where people were typing in, you know, how much does the pool cost and his articles would be coming up. <laughs> um, and, and we went through it, and, and I'd, I'd known that story. I think he ended up selling the business, but it was quite a kind of famous story in the online marketing, content marketing sort of sh- sphere. Yeah. And that very much resonated with me because I really like that transparent stuff, and I like sharing what I'm doing. And the idea that that could be marketing was very exciting to me. Like I would do it anyway, even if, if it wasn't marketing. Mm. Um, but no one had done it in beer in Australia, so like we were researching. And talking to people about how to start a brewery, we were told it would cost a million dollars. There was no content out there. So we set about, I started a podcast, we started an Instagram channel, we started a blog, we wrote, I wrote a book about how to build a brewery. We actually finished the book before we'd even built the brewery <laughs> and still still like spend probably 20 minutes a, a week signing wow. autographed copies of this book because people are still buying it. <laughs> Um, That's amazing. But it was it was it was unique. Like pe- people hadn't done that before. And now in Australia, if you Google anything to do with starting a brewery or you know building a portable bar or um, how much does craft beer cost, then our website comes up first every time. Wow. And um, you know we're, we're kind of known as people who who will generously share this stuff. And it's a unique thing to be known for. Um, and it builds a lot of loyalty as well. We've got a really really loyal following online and offline that we've built up, um, turn that into projects with Call of Duty and equity crowdfunding rounds and, you know, really active Facebook group of ambassadors and all this kind of stuff that we've just kind of kept pouring fuel on the fire. Yeah. yeah. How, how did the Call of Duty thing come about? Did they reach out to you? Was that something that you set the wheels in motion? How did how did that happen for you? No, we, we, we've never really set any wheels in motion for anything. <laughs> and and that, that that's another, even the actual physical brewery, 
came about because I got an email from a guy who was wanting to buy the building, hadn't even bought it yet, and um, was like, oh, I found this building and, and I emailed a blogger to ask them who's doing something interesting. And this blogger had just written about us because he'd seen all the content we'd written and he thought we were we were kind of doing a proper brewery, which we weren't really. Mm-hmm. We were kind of thinking about it, but we didn't have any kind of concrete plans. Um, and that all came from the content. And he's like, oh, come check it out. And I came and looked at it. And I'm like, this place is epic. We, we should... We should do it here, and that's our that's our brewery. I'm, I'm here right now. Yeah, um, How cool, and man. investors <laughs> like all the investors came through that. Most of the investors came through that same approach. Um, Call of Duty came through the same same thing. That heard about us. A couple of guys who worked at their marketing firm that does their work it was like, "Oh, I've heard about this Black Ops. We should partner with them." They sent us an email, and we're like, "Okay, as long as you don't sue us, we're we're <laughs> yeah. yeah, as long as we can make some beer and slap your logo on it. <laughs> cool. Yeah. I mean, that's the." It's interesting. There's a lot of similarities. And we kind of said this before we started recording that like we've like we're reading your book and we're you know going through the, the four pillars of, of your, you know, um, compound marketing book, which, you know, it's basically brand story content community. I'm like, man, we do so much of this. And it is interesting because when you just shout something out, like for us, our megaphone is this podcast, but it's also the form of giving away our best stuff for free. That was the whole yeah. reason we even started this podcast and we closed down courses, paid stuff. We're like, this is all, we don't want to hide behind a paywall. Like we want to give it away and connect with other badasses that we can then give away your content if you're willing to like this. And yeah. um, it's interesting when we shout something out or a problem we have or something we're working towards or something, someone's going to come up and give us a solution or at least nudge us in the right direction. And it's yeah. kind of like what everything's developed for you it sounds very similar it's just give 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 and then the right thing just whoop. oh shit that's, that's right. cool <laughs> yeah and it's and the good thing about it is it's not for everyone because it's like traditional business owners don't like it at all because there's no very <laughs> measurable roi on giving shit away for free right. um and it takes a lot of confidence to back yourself and take this approach because there is a downside to it, and and, there's, and and you know we still have conversations about this stuff. Like like we don't, you can't give everything away for free. No. So there's always you know how many of your secrets and things like we put all of our recipes up online. We, we even this year we did through COVID we did a homebrew comp where mm. we made kits with our beer in it, and the people could ferment at home with our exact recipes for our core range beer. So we're like we're wow. giving away everything. Yeah. Um, I've never heard of that. That's rad. <laughs> That's really yeah. Cool. It's it's a thing. It's a thing that homebrew shops do, but I don't I don't know if any breweries have, have done it like not that. not branded but, like that though. Yeah, usually yeah. it's like some you know some guy that figured out. Oh, this is kind of like you know. Ballast Black Point yeah, may yeah. have done some stuff like that. Maybe Ballast but, yeah. Point here in San Diego. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Nice. We went there when we were there. It was pretty epic. Beautiful, huh? Yeah. yeah. They've, well, they had got, a, they've had some issues though with the those buyers. Probably they've already. I'm. Well, yeah, they got, these they got bought out by Constellation and sort of went downhill Saw from that there. Sold yeah. again or something? Yeah. And yeah. They for like nothing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway. yeah, they sold yeah. for a billion dollars and then sold again for nothing. Exactly. But yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's a tough <laughs> business. It's it's constantly like like we're going through it now. We're kind of just hitting profitability after five or six years, and um, mm. now we need to spend three million dollars on a new canning line. It's like. Sh- shit okay where do we get that kind of money from man we used um, to yeah one of our the places we rented for a while was with the brewery in uh, san diego here so we were always kind of hearing the business of breweries you know just because we were right above them we'd always smell it when they're brewing we're like oh man <laughs> gonna, you know, the hops <laughs> it's so good but um yeah because we've always or for a long time we wanted to run that we're like man that's a hell of a business model though you know it's it it's, is yeah it's fun but, and and, yeah. and i was never interested in just having a small local Brew pub. I think the original, like when me and Eddie were talking about it, he was sort of talking about doing a bar, and I was like, I don't, mm. want, I don't want a bar. That's just kind of feels like all the risk with like no upside. Sure. Um, yeah. But when the idea of a brewery came up, it was like, well, actually, you could build a brand that could be quite big. Like there was other craft breweries that were doing. I, I remember an interview with Stone and Wood at the time; they were doing fifty million dollars a year in revenue, mm. and I was like, well, that's that's a pretty decent sized business if we could start something that could, you know, approach any anywhere near that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, and it, it's been, I think this approach to marketing has been really good for us because everything is so difficult. It's, you know, you've never got enough money to do anything. Like, like we still, we we're just about to put on our first marketing person and she's still not going to be full-time in marketing. And that's after 59 other hires. Wow. Um, wow. And so, like, we just don't have, you know, like, we just don't have the money to be hiring shitloads of people and spending lots of money on marketing. So, yeah. it helps 
to take this approach where you've got these things compounding behind the scenes without you necessarily having, having to do a whole lot. Um, you, I see our competitors buying billboards and doing shitloads of paid ads and all of that kind of stuff. And it's like, well, I'm glad we don't have to do that. I, I kind of hope we can scale this approach indefinitely because A, I'm not good at paid ads and B, it's just it's only a short-term payoff and you need someone running all of that, mm. spending all this money. I think it also diminishes the brand a little bit. I, I don't know if I really have any evidence of that, but I, I think when I think of mm -hmm. the brands that I love, I don't see them doing a lot of paid ads. Like if, like if you think of cars, I see ads for car companies all the time in Australia yeah. and all those kind of old shitty cars that I'm not interested in. And then I just, I don't see anything uh, paid wise for Tesla, but I see the product and I see the content and I see the the technology and the brand and all of that. And that just, that's the car I want. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, There's that brand, that the story industry. and all that. Yeah. It's all wrapped yeah. up in it. And he's doing it at a scale that's beyond anyone ever thought was possible. Mm. But it's all the same stuff. You know, you look at like, and I talk about that in the book a little bit, like the SpaceX, that's like when I got into content marketing, those stories like the Marcus, Marcus Sheridan one and the Red Bull was another one. That was like the big, the Red Bull space jump was the big um, yep. Bumgarner kind of content or, marketing was, event. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, he, the dude just jumps out of space with all Red Bull branding. And um, <laughs> But now if you think about what the best content marketing is, like if Red Bull were to do something like that, it would. now it's very obvious that that's marketing. Whereas, like, every time Elon launches a rocket, it's just him showing up to work and doing his job and they just happen to live stream it. And millions of people watch it. And I'm sure whoever is in the business of transporting stuff from Earth to wherever they transport it to or, you know, anyone who's in the in the business of um, running the space station or whatever, I'm sure they're watching yeah. these launches and <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm sure they know what he's doing. <laughs> yeah. And I I don't know. I don't know how the business works, but I don't think he's ha having to take out paid ads for people Googling, <laughs> how do I get shit to Mars? He's he's basically, it sounds just like a lot of documentation of your journey. Your It's your story. I mean, and this Especially is Especially if it's interesting. Yeah. Yes. yeah. And that's the other, the other thing I mentioned in the, in the book is like you, as an entrepreneur, you do have control over what you do. Mm. And like, there's a lot of different ways to approach being a business owner or a founder and you know one of them is just actively looking for interesting things to work on because if you've got something interesting to work on that you're going to make money with it turns into an asset building free marketing thing down the line mm -hmm. so if you're thinking about it like that um and, and we do this all the time like we have all these different beer ideas but if that beer idea is a particularly good story we'll go with that one because then you've then you've got all your marketing sorted and it'll sell out within hours and you won't have to do anything other than put a post up on Instagram. Um, I'm, I'm kinda so kind of curious like how you would build a story. Like what's the process look like? I, I know in the book you break down all sorts of different story. Uh, for, like you can have a, what the brand story, product story, uh, customer story, and there's probably even more, yeah. but those are the top three. It seemed like, like how would it look like for like a beer as an example? I think this is pretty fascinating because <laughs> most breweries yeah, probably well, aren't even doing this. Yeah. Well, one, one of the things we do is, um, uh, staff beer. So after a year of service, the staff member gets their own beer. They come and brew it themselves. They that we normally brand them as like cartoon branded with their face and everything on it, so it looks like the staff member. I haven't seen any other brewery do it. That there might be ones in America that do it, um, but it's always a great story because it's an opportunity to to celebrate that staff member, get them involved. There's all the content from the brew day that just goes on Instagram, and it doesn't take anything to do that. Um, it's a bit to design the label and I, I still do a lot of that with the designers myself and it takes up a lot of time. But once that's done, it's a, it's a, it's a bit, those beers always sell out super quickly and yeah. the tap rooms always pack when we bring them out because they bring their friends in and it's just like a good fun thing to do. Like if, if we could choose between that beer and just a random beer that, you know, sounds like a good idea, mm. that one's going to sell every time. And it's not just staff. We do investor beers. Sometimes we have ideas in our ambassador group. Like we did one, the ambassador group came, a guy came up with an idea for a beer and we brewed it, didn't tell him about it and then sent it to him. <laughs> um, and again, it just sold out straight away because it was a cool story. And it's just a, you know, it's, it's no different really for us to chase that idea than it is to chase one of the thousands of ideas that's written in our Google doc. Mm -hmm. But if you're thinking about it from a story point of view and also a brand point of view, like I, I'm like, we've got beers that started as brands and ended up as beers. Um, and even 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 beers in the core range that that 
or going into the core range that were like, we want a beer called this, <laughs> or I'll have a chat with my designers. Be like, like we've got beers that started from a conversation with my designer where he comes up with his phone and is like, oh, I've got this um, new thing on here where we can make clouds. Uh-huh. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's cool. Show us. Oh, that looks cool. And he's like, can we do some kind of beer with the word cloud? And I'm like, yeah, we can do that for sure. <laughs> and then so we, we came up with this like cloud series. And um, but, then we, but then when we launched it, we got all these comments about how good a job we did with the design. But really, the, it was a beer that we made for the design, not a design for the beer. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. And, and yeah. that's the power of story and, yeah, yeah. and having everything back up this, I mean, it might start in a weird way, but it's like it's tight. The glue is this story and what makes that part of the bigger picture, it seems like. Yeah. That's- and you can get a lot more leverage out of it as well, because like we then are, then I, so we did the cloud series and then. We, we, one of the beers we did was called Cream Cloud, which was an investor beer. So that was another story-driven beer. Absolutely flew at the tap room. Mm. So bringing that back was another beer that was just going to sell it instantly. And then we, we did another one called Thunder Cloud, which was with uh, our first brewer, whose surname was Cloud, who's actually from San Diego nice. and is back there now, um, was one of his homebrew recipes. So that was the second one. And then we did Acid Cloud, which mm. didn't have a story, but we had two out of three that did, both with good branding. And then the series sold out super quickly. And then um, after that, we did an article on, you know, how we come up with beer idea names and and what, you know, what how we come up with the design of cans. And so then we've got articles on the site that are kind of compounding over time, getting more traffic. Um, and, yeah, and they, they, they kind of, they, they, they go off each other. Yeah. Well, that's, that's what it really comes down to is story is making up the brand really at the end of the day. And mm-hmm. that's what we, when we're preparing for this, we're like, man, that, I think that's the thing we'd like to hone in on this because, you know, a lot of folks, when you think of brands, it's like your logo, it's just the design. It's like, yeah, cool. It's part of it. But I mean, I would wager that the story is probably waiting maybe a little further, you know, it might it maybe start with the design. Um, but the brand yeah, at the I think end of the day. I think the, yeah. the, the whole concept of brand is kind of like how people feel, to me anyway, how they feel when they see it. Mm-hmm. And so it is visual, but ultimately it comes back to how you feel. And um, that's what I mean with like the excessive paid advertising. You might have a really good looking brand, but you're not going to influence how someone feels. Well, I'm not going to say you're not going to influence how someone feels, but you have to be very, very good at advertising and paid ads to positively influence how someone feels about your brand. Um, also have to be very, very good at design. Um, and you run a high risk of having the opposite effect because if you're just plastering a brand out there that people can see you're just flogging it, then it's going to reduce the trust and it's going to hurt the way people feel about the brand. Um, but it's the same thing with with design. Like if we – I do think the visual stuff is super important and we get, we get prompted by people for doing collabs all the time and the first thing that comes into my mind is – Collabs are always a good story. So, you know, they're a good thing to say yes to. They're a lot of work, but they're better than us just brewing a random beer. Mm. And then it's the branding. It's like, well, I know what our branding looks like. What does your branding look like? And can we do something really cool with this concept? Mm-hmm. Um, and if we can, it's it's a tick and, and we'll do it. If we can't, it's kind of like, well, it might be a lot of work to do this. And, it, you know, there might be other ideas out there that are just going to work better visually and, and might be better to do. So it's something... I'm thinking about from the very early stages of even potentially doing a beer is like how it could ultimately end up looking and if there's a story that it will kind of flow with it as well. And if, if those two things happen, and obviously the product has to be good, that probably should go without saying, <laughs> but it but it, it, it does need to be said. The product has to be good. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, th- those those beers will fly, and, and they won't require any marketing. That they will just fly. Yeah, and uh, other ones won't. Even if your main core brand and your main audience is strong, they just get lost in the sea of the millions of products that are getting released. Mm. Yeah, no, that that totally makes sense. I- I'm curious, like, what advice would you give somebody if they've got a business that's already kind of going, but they don't necessarily have a story behind it? They don't know how to tell their story of their business, or maybe they just think their story is boring. Like how? Do you have any advice on like sort of uncovering the story that could help a business get traction? Yeah, the first thing I'd say is is I mean you, you, what you said before about the different types of stories. You don't have to have a founding story. Like there's plenty of businesses out there where the the story of the business being founded is not relevant at all to to the brand itself. It, it's worked very well for my last two businesses. Um, 
But that's only one type of story. And the, the ones we've been talking about, product stories are, are available everywhere, especially if you chase them. Mm. And that's probably the first piece of advice is if you don't have any interesting stories, then maybe you're not chasing enough interesting work mm. and maybe you're not thinking about the story and how powerful it can be when you decide on things to do. So I would be looking for opportunities where stories will, will naturally fall into what you do. Um, customer stories are another one. Are you doing some interesting work? Are you collaborating with interesting people? Um, that kind of thing. I don't like the idea of, and also like if, if they think it's boring, you know, they, they could be wrong. I mean, like our, you know, you, you, there are ways to tell stories that are more compelling, even if the stories aren't in themselves inherently amazing. Um, but I don't like the idea of just either making up fake stories, which I see happen, or just presenting a brand that looks like a story, but actually isn't one. Like there's a lot of that in craft beer. It's like, mm -hmm. This is a convict that, so that stole all this shit and, you know, we uncovered his recipe and it's like, yeah, I don't think that. <laughs> I could think of a wine company that does that too. There's probably all, yeah, everybody like, yeah, yeah. and it's like, come on, really? <laughs> it's like, yeah, so I don't, really I don't like that kind of stuff personally. Yeah. To be honest, maybe it works. I don't know, but it, that doesn't fit into what I do. Um, and, you know, maybe there is a chance that there's absolutely zero stories. Maybe the business is boring. You know, I mean, like our... Our business that we decided to start as founders is an exciting, fun business with a great story and a great brand. And, and ultimately, it's up to the entrepreneur to start a business that's going to work. And if you start a business and that's boring, that you can't build anything fun out of, then I wouldn't force it. I would do a better business. <laughs> you know, it's, it's true. It, yeah. it's, it sucks to say that, but it is. I've found a lot in business that there's a lot, there's so much power in momentum and that kind of flywheel thing that like the businesses that I've had that have worked well have been ones where you kind of feel like you're being pushed along and you're just kind of trying to navigate it or even just trying to keep up. Mm. That's that's the kind of business you want if you want a high growth business. If if And it's the same with marketing. Like our, the marketing should be kind of pulling you along as opposed to you pushing it. And then I've tried the other approach, believe me, and it's really hard, like like what you're talking about, you know, how do I kind of force a good story into a situation? Um, to me, that doesn't sound like the kind of business that I want. And and what I what I did, which was pretty ruthless, was just shut down shitloads of ideas that didn't work. Mm. And, you know, that's something I've written about, um, just this idea of giving up being very powerful because there's just because, you know, everyone says you have to keep going and you have to persevere and all of that, I mean, if, if if it's not working, maybe you don't. Maybe maybe you need to give up and try something else. You, you, the opportunity cost of persevering with a bad idea is picking up a good idea. Mm. And um, I've shut down a lot of bad stuff to really double down on really only two ideas I've ever had that have have worked out of hundreds. I mean, that's. I think you said like two things really powerful is is choose interesting work. So then, and then you have the flywheel and. I mean, it's one and the same. It's it's creating this momentum for you. And if it's fun, if it's interesting for you and you're happy to show up every day, you have new ideas and maybe a community that helps propel it even further too once you start talking about it. Like it's, yeah, it, you can't stop it. And why would you? Like yeah. there's gotta be something yeah. good in there. Well, and at the end of the day yeah, too, and, and, go ahead. No, you go. I was just going to say at the end of the day, every business also has their sort of behind the scenes, right? Like, you know, it, I, I, like, you can go and make content that shows how the brewery works. You can go make content that shows the the bottling machine and how this bottling machine is, you know, pouring the beer, putting the lids on, ratting the labels. And just like that kind of content could be woven into a story that can make people sort of uh, make your brand appealing to people. Yeah. I did, the other two things I'd say on that point is, is one is you got to do what you're good at. Like you, I can tell you guys are good at what you do with this podcasting thing. Not everyone is like I've, listen to lots of podcasts that they're, they're not all that good you know <laughs> true. I mean? like true like i it's not as simple as like if, if you guys are having success with this podcast it's not as simple as saying to someone else go to a podcast because it's working for us like i don't think that's what it's about with content at all i think it's all about finding something that you're good at and i don't think you need to be i think you can get better at things of course um but because of the amount of kind of hustle involved in putting out a lot of this content you almost need to find that medium that you really enjoy and that you're really good at early on because mm -hmm. like I've and, and and the medium that I found was just writing and and also like blog posts with with 
lots of images because I really enjoyed making them look pretty. I like doing the nice images and I like writing lots of words. And to, to be honest, like I've written six books. I don't, I don't think I'm particularly good at it. I just think I'm better at that than any other form of marketing. And so that's what I do. Um, and so I think you do need to choose something that you're good at. And if the storytelling or content writing or whatever isn't on that list, maybe you don't do it. Maybe you do something else. Um, the other thing I'd say is I, it annoys me when you have these podcast interviews and someone comes on and be like, this is the exact structure you have to do. Like I read one of these books on storytelling and it's like, this is the structure you have to do and you'll be successful. Like I don't believe that at all. Like mm. there's loads of businesses out there who don't do any storytelling, who don't give a fuck about their design, um, don't really do any community stuff and don't do content and they're doing just fine because they've found something else that they're good at. And um, that's perfectly fine too. If you, you know, I know guys who have, you know, Amazon businesses and online businesses that just run paid ads, like some of them, you wouldn't even know what the brands are. Mm -hmm. It works for them. Don't, yeah. don't listen to me. Like, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's fine. Yeah. It's completely fine to do what works. And that's, it's taken me a long time to find this approach, which has worked a couple of times for me. And that's why I'm sharing it. But it doesn't necessarily mean it's perfect for every person listening to this. Well, it goes back to what you said about James Shramko and Pat Flynn. Like you're not modeling their business models, but you're kind of plucking certain elements. And, you know, that goes for any mentor or person or business, whoever you're trying to kind of model, but there's probably, you're probably not modeling them as a whole. It's probably an aspect of it. So it's like, get I think really that's clear. a better approach. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's what um, James did. You know, he used to talk about Jay Abraham and mm -hmm. um, the, the copywriters, like he'd take bits of those, but then he'd also talk about the um, sales, like persuasion type stuff and um you know he was doing online marketing as well so he was following guys like pat flynn and picking up little bits here and there from got from guys like that and and just kind of building into his his own little thing and that's that's what i've tried to do there's a lot of things i'd like to do that i'm not particularly good at um but it to me it doesn't really make sense you, you can get better at things over time but you, you just got to try and find something you're good at, I think. Yeah. And and to, to be honest, it's a kind of a lucky time to be around because the, I, I don't know if there's ever really been a time before where like a couple of lads can just sit there and talk. No and kidding. Kind of <laughs> build, build an audience and build a business as a result it, of doing that. So I'm happy you said cool. that because it feels like we're cheating half the time. We're like, <laughs> what the fuck? We're literally just hanging around <laughs> chatting with a guy with beer <laughs> about beer marketing and just having to get in like, and you're in Australia. It's like, holy shit. Like, this is so cool. And we do yeah. have a business behind it but yeah i mean like there's a lot of content or people out there that might be doing it for the love of it but maybe they can't connect the two you know but that's a tricky one too yeah and and business is hard you know like 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 that that was my situation for many years i think i started blogging in 2010 or 2009 and i'd done bits and pieces before then and it wasn't 2013 was when wp curve took off so i'd, I'd written hundreds and hundreds of blog posts and done loads of podcasts and heaps and heaps of content that just didn't go anywhere. Mm. And I only had, I think, I think I wrote two blog posts, one or two blog posts that did well out of hundreds and hundreds. <laughs> and those were the ones that kind of formed my brand. Like, like one of them was um, uh, about how to validate a startup. And that ended up becoming basically the story behind WP Curve. It ended up becoming the seven-day startup mm. book and brand. And I turned that into you know, online communities and events and all kinds of stuff. And it was just, it just started as one blog post. And I've seen, I've seen other people do the same thing where, where they've kind of put a lot of stuff out there, but one thing's gotten traction and that's the thing that they've really doubled down on. And, you know, one little successful piece of content can be so much more powerful than hundreds of unsuccessful ones. And I think if, if you get to the point where you guys potentially are at where you do have a good active audience, um, mm -hmm where everything you put out kind of gets devoured and people like it, like that's awesome. But yeah. a lot of people aren't in that situation. And when you start, you're just putting a lot of stuff out there and you just have no idea what people want. For and sure. you're kind of paying attention to these vanity metrics where you're like, oh, well, this one got this many views or this many downloads, so therefore it's the best piece of content. But I think the, the more intangible things around traction are more powerful, like figuring out what's now, what people really care about. And that's what I noticed with that blog post. It was like all the comments on that post. It was like, oh, wow, this is really interesting. This is changing my approach to doing something. Like if you can influence someone's behavior, mm. that's more powerful than any statistic you're ever going to see on any report. Sure. And oh, yeah, that's, 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 that's subconscious. That's like 
Yeah, that's going to change their complete perspective in life as well. I'm assuming not just in business, you know. Yeah, and, and I found that with Black Ops as well. We like our stats on anything aren't particularly good with marketing, other than social media is is pretty strong. But like the podcast, we don't get a lot of downloads for the podcast. The articles don't get visited a lot unless they happen to rank well in Google or like there's one or two that go really well. Like the craft beer prices one hmm. goes really well. Um, but what I did notice was. Um, when we'd go to events in person, people would come up to me and they'd talk to me about things on the podcast or articles we'd written. And it was a small group of people, but they were talking to me in, in a way where I knew the stuff we were putting out was actually changing their behavior. And that, to me, that's way more powerful. Like, you know, you're getting traction. Podcasts are tough because the, the stats are almost mm -hmm. meaningless. They suck. Like, yeah. You know, yeah. you're getting traction if someone's, if someone's saying, like, you know, I started a business because of you. Um, that's more, more more powerful than than any statistic, and that's the stuff we kind of try to pay attention to. Go out. And this particular thing was interesting. I did this as a result. Well, then it's like, oh, that's an opportunity to do more content around that topic because this is actually moving people as opposed to just getting a bunch of hints from random Google searches. Mm. Yeah, I mean that's where it goes to community. Yeah, I know where. Uh, I don't want to crack open that whole uh, wormhole <laughs> because <laughs> that's probably a big one, but community really supports you and all that if they can connect with what you're putting out there and your products your stories all that i mean that's what it sounds like from wp curve days now at black hops it's your community that's propelling you on social and telling their friends and that's your flywheel in action yeah. again yeah yeah and, we, and we've taken that to the ex extreme now like our um we turned our very small facebook group which we put together when we wrote the book into an ambassador group that now has two and a half thousand people in it and and not that that number is important the important is the activity in the group it's super super active in, in some cases i'll put something in that group that'll get more likes on our main social media account which has twenty seven thousand followers <laughs> um so 10 times as many but you get more activity often in threads or likes or whatever in the group because it's so much more meaningful it's so much more personable um and those guys ended up investing in the business through equity crowdfunding. They promote us everywhere. They vote for us. Like we just got voted the, the number one craft brewery in the country. No. And we're, we're quite small compared to a lot of the other craft breweries, but we've got this kind of rabid group of people who are really into what we're doing. And, you know, when we want vote for something, we ask for it and, and we tend to get a lot of them. <laughs> um, so that's just turned into this big epic. And the, the marketing from that was amazing and it didn't cost us a cent. So it's just another example of that kind of flywheel working. Mm. Dig it. Oh, cool. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I was I was just going to I was going to make a point about something you were saying earlier that uh, about the, the, the content that you're putting out, just like a few pieces of the content hit. But I think a key there is to keep on putting out content, even if it's not always hitting, because every once in a while, some of it will hit and get sort of this mass appeal. Um, I remember. Maybe. Or, or maybe maybe it won't. And that's the, that's the tricky thing. I don't think it's as simple as keeping putting content out because then you're almost saying, I'm not even going to bother trying to work out what's going to get traction. I'm just going to put out a whole bunch of shit and see what gets traction. Whereas I think it is still super important to really be in tune with what is the stuff that people care about. And and even now, like literally just before this this meeting, um, this interview, I was my, I've was i got a guy who, who works with me one day a week pre-drafting some of my posts mm -hmm. and He's got a whole bunch of ideas in this document and I'm still constantly thinking about, okay, is this a good idea? Will this go well? Can we tweak this idea? Be, you know, because it kind of sounds a bit boring, but can we tweak it to answer a question that we get asked all the time? And therefore, I know the content's going to go well. So being in tune with, and it's, it's still a guess. I don't know if the content's going to go well, but I ranked them one to five on, do I think this will crush? Do I think it won't crush? Mm -hmm. And I'm not always right, but you get more and more in tune with what's going to work. And you're right, you have to keep putting out the content, but you also have to get more and more in tune with what's going to work. Otherwise, you're just going to put out a whole bunch of content and get nothing mm -hmm. from it. Burn out. Yeah. 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 Uh, that's so I'll, give, the you, I'll give you the specific yeah. example just because it's fresh in my mind and it might apply to other people. Um, the idea he had in there was um, a day in the life of a brewer or a day in the life of a sales rep. And I was like, okay, we, we can write this, but it's not going to be the most intriguing thing to read. Um, but one thing we get asked all the time is how do you become a brewer or how do you become a sales rep and how do you get in, into the industry? Mm -hmm. So 
we're just going to tweak that idea a little bit. And instead of writing a day in the life, we'll do, you know, how do you become a brewer at Black Ops or how do you become a sales rep at Black Ops? Go through the existing guys. Who were the guys that got a, a sales job at Black Ops that didn't previously have sales experience? Because that's that's they're the people always asking these questions. I got mm-hmm. this long email yesterday from a guy saying, how, I don't have any sales experience. How do I get a job? Job in sales, and we get that stuff all the time. So if you're getting questions, people want to know the answers, and that's a gold mine for content. So I think that idea, with a very very minor tweak, will we'll probably get 10, 20, 30 times the results of the other idea, which which might just be a kind of an interesting thing to read if you're bored. But it's not really solving a specific problem, a really useful problem that no one else has solved. Yeah, yeah, and that's the power of the community. They're giving you, they're kind of feeding you all the questions, all the problems mm. that they have, as long as you're listening and capturing those, and then ranking them, like you said. And maybe yeah. throwing in a little bit of your own creative spin on it too, then it's probably pretty good. <laughs> you know? Yeah, and it, and this, there is more scientific ways to do it. I think in in mm-hmm. the content machine book that I wrote, uh, I think 2015, which is a little bit out of date now because a lot of the examples were kind of online entrepreneurs. Actually, maybe it's not too out of date. It's probably they're all probably still relevant to be honest. Um, but that was a I did I did look at a lot of ways in there to be a bit more scientific around generating content ideas by using you know, the Google keyword tool, which has changed now, but um, other tools online for kind of working out what people are searching for. Like there's definitely merit to some of that. And we do do some of that. Like if we're short of ideas, we'll kind of have a look at what people are searching for or, you know, look at look at what are the big problems that people have and look at the content that's been written on it and is it actually that good? And if it's not, then maybe there's an opportunity there to do something better and become that kind of pillar piece of content for that topic. So it doesn't all have to be just intuition, but mm. I've found the... Um, that more intuitive approach didn't come naturally to me, but that's been the one that's been the most powerful. Yeah, well, a good resource we just found recently, we had Rand Fishkin on the show and he has a tool called Spark Toro now. Yeah. And yeah, 10 uses for free per month. So you could pretty much do what, you know, if you don't have enough uh, intel from your folks, you know, and hearing from them, you can see, okay, well, all this other data from these other resources it aggregates for you. So kind of yep. that's maybe another scientific way you can kind of drum up some ideas or cross check a little or bit. an easy way if you're starting from scratch and you sure. don't necessarily have community feedback yet yeah. sure. exactly yeah. yeah that's more what i was thinking if, if you because it's easy i always used to think this when i was listening to interviews with people and they're kind of like yeah just ask your community I'm like but i don't have a community yeah. i don't have anyone to, to ask <laughs> and it is hard it's a kind of chicken and the egg thing so but but there are ways and you know everyone who does have a community previously didn't have one, so there are ways to kind of cross that bridge. Yeah. Uh, but but it is harder, and it maybe does require a lot more of that sort of analytical side or getting out and talking to people. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, just a, a more experimentation. I think now when we write a piece of content, I feel like I know a lot more how well it's going to go. Whereas at the start, it was really like I have no clue. I don't know what people want. We're just going to write what we're doing, and we'll see what. We'll see what traction we get. Yeah. But like we've got posts on our site that will get 10,000, tens of thousands of views um, in a year that are old posts that, you know, haven't been touched. And we'll get others that'll get, that will bring out this month and get a few hundred and then disappear forever. Mm. So like the, the difference between, you know, and, and, and it didn't take necessarily longer to create that content. It's, it's just that they're both decent, proper blog posts with a lot of effort put into them. Um, but the difference between a, an average idea and a good one is so powerful that it's really worth trying to tune yourself into to what are going to be the really good ones. And I think with with written content, social media, it seems to be really, really powerful, the difference between something that crushes and something that just doesn't. Um, I've seen it with podcasting as well. I think it's probably a little bit less extent with podcasting, but I know the podcasts I listen to, there's always those sort of pivotal interviews on those podcasts mm-hmm that gets shared a lot. I don't even know how it happens, but it kind of ends up being the ones that that really blow that podcast up. Yeah. Um, We've had a few of those sure too. We're like, I don't know how. <laughs> like, why? Yeah. yeah. Because it's all it's because it's organic and, and it's kind of compounding without you having to do anything, which is which is yeah. powerful. Yeah. But I'm sure the difference between like, do you have them on your show? Do you have podcasts that have blown up compared to others? I mean, definitely. Yeah. There's a few that were like, and they're not even interviews that we particularly thought 
they would do well. You yeah, know, we look back yeah. at the stats, we're like, why is that just light years ahead? This other one that we thought we'd crush. But well, it's almost never the big names. It's almost never like the the you know yeah. the 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 guru that everybody knows their name. We finally got them on the podcast. Those ones are usually the underperformers of our of our show, to be honest, which is interesting. interesting. Yeah, but yeah. there's trends all over. Who knows? <laughs> it, it it is it is a it is pretty random. I think maybe there's someone out there who can fully analyze it, but I think. I think generally good content rises to the top and um, if your approach is to create as much good content as you can and and in the definition of good content needs to be is it meaningful for someone else? You know, it can't just be something that you think is good. It needs mm. to be meaningful right. enough to move someone else and if you commit to that, I think that's I, th- I think that's the best approach. Eventually, you're going to fall into these interviews and these these written blog posts and these social media posts that do so much better than the other ones that you know you kind of wonder why you even do the other ones. But that's <laughs> that's what you're looking for is those really big pieces of traction. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Well, um, I'm hearing TikTok is working pretty well for uh, testing out some new ideas. So maybe yeah. Uh... <laughs> 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 no, we haven't ventured there. I just keep hearing it from others. <laughs> <laughs> Let's wrap it up. And I'm uh, Compound Marketing is the book. Uh, where's the best place for folks to go get that? I know it's pretty much everywhere. Amazon for sure. It's on. Yeah, it's only on. My books are only on Amazon, so I don't mm. sell any, anything anymore. I've just got them up there. If you want them, you can get them on there. You can actually illegally download pretty much all of my books you can just go into google and put pdf because i did it myself just to check the quality of them and they're fine so you can do that <laughs> i love it i mean that's like literally why in the first chapter the first page i was like great there's nothing to sell here i mean it's just like one of those like oh as a reader you're like cool yeah there's no agenda here. i can say with 100 percent confidence that you're the first guest we've ever had that told listeners to go pirate their books <laughs> i'm not saying go do it i mean i don't know how dodgy these websites are but i'm saying if you right. want to do it i, I don't care but not the brewery one. Hopefully no. That one's not on there. You, you got to buy that one. Hell yeah. But, um, <laughs> well, um, they're also on. I've done audio books. I actually, because I like, I think Amazon and Audible have done a good enough job with their product that, you know, I, I don't really, I don't pirate books anymore because I, I mean, it's not the, not the best thing to do as a human being. Right, right. I understand if you've got no money and everything. It's I a karmic a thing it. that's out there. Yeah. 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 But it's, but the product is so good. Like I'm listening to audio books on Audible. And it's just, you know, it's worth it. It's worth spending a couple of dollars. So yeah. I, yeah. that's normally what I do. But yeah, I, I I write the books because A, I enjoy the process and B, I like sharing, hoping it'll help someone else. And and I don't make a lot of money from them. And I mm-hmm. I don't want to because I want one thing to focus on and I got my hands full with a brewery. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, good thing. and the brewery, if people want to check that out, they can go to blackhops.com.au. Uh, only, it's only available in Australia right now, but I know we do have quite a few listeners in Australia. Mm-hmm. Thanks to James Shramko having us on his show like five times. It's true. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, well, it, yeah. I mean, if people do, it's surprising how f- far the, the beer has spread in Australia. So if you do listen to this podcast yes. and you do drink my beer, <laughs> tag me in it and then tag these guys so they know because it'd be cool to see that. I would love to see that. Yeah. Awesome, Dan. Well, I appreciate you, my man. It's been fun. Yeah, hopefully, uh, it's been fun. Hopefully, we can get into the same city at some point and have a beer together. Either out there, we're, or we're San so Diego. keen to go back to America. So you, yeah, you got no idea. Give I us might a shout leave in a San few Diego. months, but I'm definitely keen. <laughs> we'll make it happen. All right, my man. Have a good one. Cheers, guys. Bye. I'm thirsty for what? Suds it's for suds. I wish we had some. I don't know why we weren't all drinking beers. We really should have been. That is. I don't have beer though. Well, actually, I don't have any at my house. I don't know the last time I had a beer. Actually, <laughs> that would be uh, bad to admit in front of Dan. Hopefully, he doesn't listen to this part. Yeah, uh, I think I think anybody who's listened to us for a while probably thinks that we're like hardcore beer fans because we had Homebrew Academy. I mean, we I do things at a beer. brewery. We worst no you work above a brewery. Beer. Yeah, <laughs> but the reality is, I probably have a beer like once a month. <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm pretty close to it, man. I'm more I'm more wine these days. Got some got some nice uh, bourbon waiting for me at home tonight. Some rye. Yeah, I do. Um, I do. I tend to do more whiskey and uh, yeah. and diet coke. Like the Diet Coke whiskey, like uh, either okay. Bullet Rye. Um, yeah, or, Bullet Rye is what I got waiting for me right now. Yeah, I like to mix Bullet Rye with with Coke Zero specific. Like Ooh. Bullet Rye plus Coke Zero is like my favorite blend. <laughs> I've never had, but I would love to 
join one join one with you have one with you soon well i might have some of that i don't have beer i know i don't have beer because i don't we don't keep it's really okay. stocked it's up okay. on beer unless we're I having a barbecue you. or something but I forgive you my friend <laughs> but, <laughs> but i am i do pretty much always have some whiskey lying around <laughs> whiskey is a good touch but uh yeah we're, we are not alcoholics i promise but it might sound like we are sometimes <laughs> yeah. but uh we have other vices that are a little more frequent we'll just say yeah like uh running um <laughs> just kidding <laughs> No, but Dan, I mean, we could have kept riffing with him for a long oh, time. He's one of them folks. You for know? sure. That we could have gone two hours with him, but, uh, you know. Yeah, well, I guess we have time limits. It's also getting should. to be nighttime here while we're recording this, so. <laughs> I probably should go home. It's close to dinner time. So, but yeah, man, I mean, I don't know. What, what, I, I felt like I was, uh. I, I, I was I was nerding out and mm-hmm. uh, didn't let you in a, <laughs> a little bit. So I want to hear, I want to hear you. You want to hear me. Well, um, what, how are you feeling about Mr. Dano and what he said here? This is. Yeah, I mean, I, I really, I, I really enjoyed it. I, I think the, the funny thing is we, we always sort of prep for these calls like you and I, we're, we sit around and we like sort of. Well, <laughs> I say sort of as a filler word, it, I, but I mean, I'm seeing two pages of notes here. Yeah. <laughs> we prep for these calls like mofos, right? But about 20 minutes before we jump on the podcast, you and I kind of sit around and have a discussion about like, here's where I think we should take it. Here's here's the sort of problem I think we should want to we should try to solve for our listeners minds. Here's the gap we're trying to close, right? Like that's that that's sort of how we've sort of defined our podcast recently is the guests that we're bringing on what sort of knowledge do they have what have they managed to achieve mm-hmm. um you know what what do they know that we wish we knew and how do we close that gap like yeah. that's kind of how we're doing it so we always have this discussion before these interviews of all right what is the thing we're trying to close the gap on and the funny thing is i think when we actually had the conversation it actually went in a different direction than we were sort of anticipating mm. Yeah, because the gap here is like it was a lot of the storytelling and branding. Storytelling I mean, and branding we covered that a crap ton. Oh shit, ton here. It was just in maybe not the uh, the specific questions we would have had. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it, it wasn't it wasn't sort of the flow that I was anticipating with it, but um, we we did kind of cover it quite a bit. And I think uh, what I really really like about what he's doing is that it is all like the content is the marketing strategy, mm-hmm. right? So his his whole strategy with like Black Hops of going and answering all these like super common questions about beer these super common questions about how breweries work all of these super common questions getting hired (laughs) as a sales rep for his company yeah how to get hired as a sale like all of these questions that people commonly ask now in australia if you google any of these questions you find his brewery now he's not going for the sale with that content it's not like you read it and go oh i need to order this guy's beer now but because every time you have a question about beer he's the guy that you see his brand is the brand that you see his beer is probably the most top of mind beer when you're like, I need to go get some beer now. <laughs> He's the number one brewery in a craft brewery in Australia. Yeah. I mean, so it's I saying think, something on the back of this content. Yeah, yeah. So that that sort of like strategy could be applied to everything. No sure. matter what your business model is, you can show behind the scenes content. You can ask, um, answer common questions. You can see what your community is talking about and join the discussion in the form of blog posts. All of this, this content eventually could potentially get ranked and when people search these questions and they find your answers you're now that top of mind brand when it comes time for them to order whatever this product is Mm -hmm. right he did the same thing with wp curve Mm -hmm. like he his his blog i think used to answer just a shit ton of questions about wordpress that's what he said yeah he doesn't have it anymore he said that content but yeah he yeah like crazy so if you had questions about wordpress back in what do you say 2013 somewhere around there yeah. yeah so if you had questions about wordpress you'd google them and his site was probably what was popping up about wordpress mm-hmm. you click you read them and then you go oh well what is this wp curve site that i'm looking at and then you find out his company will do a lot of the wordpress mm-hmm. stuff for you mm-hmm. right and both of Clever. his big brands wp curve and black hops brewing followed that exact same model be the people who show up when others have questions. Mm-hmm. And I, I really feel like you could sort of sum up his entire strategy, like in that little nutshell there is be the brand that shows up when others have questions about this topic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. And another thing that stood out to me that, um, that I think fuels all of this is just, uh, and I, I brought it up a little bit is chase something interesting, like interesting work. Mm-hmm. So it's like, yeah, maybe, I don't know, maybe something's not super interesting, but you can make it interesting. Maybe it's through your content or mm-hmm. through a story you tell or a design you make, and then you make a story around that and then build content yeah. and then a community. 
and it all has this flywheel approach. I like the way that he said that is, you know, with just fun, inherently like a fun business. Like that's why we actually wanted to start a brewery at one time too. And then it we, sounded fun. It sounded fun. And then we started working in a, we didn't work in one, but we've definitely been in many a breweries and worked in them. Yeah. Not, for a paid gig, but to brew our own beer on their system and then Don't share with people. friends. I'm telling our story, <laughs> damn it. Uh, but the idea is, uh, yeah, I don't want to run a brewer anymore. No. But I wouldn't mind owning one and yeah. hanging out in one and seeing because it's fun. Yeah. But I think having a fun thing because I, I feel like that in our minds, I feel like brewing is maybe always something that's always there. Like mm-hmm. we didn't, I don't know if we said it on the episode, I think it was before, but our overtime parties. Mm hmm are held in breweries and you know these overtime parties are what the last one we had like 500 people there it was during traffic and conversion i think it was like two years ago now mm-hmm. it was the last one that was held yeah we didn't do one in 2020 so it was the last mm-hmm. one would have been 2019 so we hold it in a brewery in san diego downtown it's uh downtown san diego it's mission brewery and we'll have this event that we want to have for ourselves but we just happen to brew a, a beer on their system a couple weeks before yeah. And then share it with our friends. I mean, we don't pay anything. The brewery uh, doesn't charge us for it. We just make sure. I mean, it's like five dollars a brew. It's like big deal, yeah. you know. But it's a special story now that we usually name. What well, like we have like KPI IPA. I remember that, yeah. which is total marketing lingo. That like <laughs> yeah. is so stupid if it was outside of our internet marketing bubble. But um, Dan Ryan, that was an amazing name. Uh-huh. Uh, <laughs> but like that's the whole thing. It was driven off of fun. You yep. know, it wasn't like, oh, this is our, uh, you know, this is an event that we can do to make money, which we did make some, and we covered our costs basically, you know, but like we made it this cool event on the back of having fun in this beer. I don't even thing. know if the event came before the brewing. Like I almost, I think like our first time through when we did it at Benchmark Brewing. Mm-hmm. So we've done them at Benchmark Brewing a couple of times. We did it at Council Brewing. Mm-hmm. We did it at McKellar. We've done, and then RIP most, Council uh, and, and Benchmark. Benchmark. Yeah, we're, business, we're like the we're like the touch of death to all these breweries. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. no, because we, we do it at Mission Brewery most of the time and they're still up and we did it at McKellar and they're still thriving. True. So um but uh I, I think when we did our our brewing the first time at Benchmark, we just wanted to go brew a beer on their yes. system. And then while we were in the process of brewing the beer, we're like, we should throw a big party and invite people to drink our beer with us. Well, <laughs> here let's break this down a little bit because I think this is super fascinating. We were interested by beer. Yep. We happened to sync up and actually uh, rent an office. Well, <laughs> here's another funny story. We paid for our rent with beer. We did. <laughs> Thank you, Dan Ryan, mm-hmm. again. Um, but we hung out with Dan Ryan and the crew there, Eric, Jenny, and all the, you know. Mike. Yeah. yeah we had like everybody else kind of just piled in after that. But we rented a an office. It was above a brewery. It mm-hmm. was literally the landlord was the brewery, yeah. Benchmark. And just because of our interest, we would go hang out in the brewery all the time. I mean, I definitely we mm. packed on some weight because we'd have a brew like every day. Yeah. Or five. I finally just got rid of that that weight like three <laughs> years later. But like we we would always ask questions to the brewers, and then yeah. we'd be like, and then we'd be like, yeah, just come back in the back, and we'll show you around. And we're like, yeah. this is rad, and then we'd see everything. And we're like, can we brew a beer on your system? Yeah, why not? Can we have a party here at your brewery? Sure. Can we invite all of our marketing friends and talk about marketing nerd shit and yeah. take over your brewery for a night? okay yep. <laughs> and that was pretty much how it started <laughs> yeah and then we did that and we packed the house mm-hmm. like probably like fire marshal wouldn't have approved kind of packed the house <laughs> numerous times um, numerous events and and then benchmark went you know what that little party thing that you did you guys should do that more often <laughs> you know and, and that became over well it was overtime existing whatever we called it overtime yeah you know and yeah if we tried to explain the entire origin story it gets very convoluted but yeah that's the parts that they need to know <laughs> I mean, and the point of megan yeah we chased something interesting because it was interesting to us we found people that would that were knowledgeable like eric and dan mm-hmm. way more knowledgeable in beer than us and connected know? in that industry and connected super con- and jenny of course i, I mean i mean they're yeah, the master jenny was the one who was the most really, connected really yeah, <laughs> yeah jenny and eric i mean like you guys hell yeah the yeah. rose uh check them out they're awesome <laughs> and uh yeah, I mean, that just developed into an interesting, I mean, now if you think about the flywheel, the last 500 people on the back of traffic and conversion, mm-hmm. and it's like we had most of the speakers from traffic and conversion at our at our event, mm-hmm. and it was, it was definitely competing with other parties happening, but guess what happened? 
lot of those party members would come to our party yeah. after they were like well, we always started ours early too so there's yeah. like a lot of parties that didn't even start till like 10 p.m so we always started ours at like six, six yeah. people would come hang out for like two hours and sort of pre-warm up for whatever late <laughs> night party they were going to <laughs> hey if you've if you've been at that party i would love to hear from you i know like uh like mike rhodes mm-hmm. you know he's he's been on the show here and i don't know he just popped in my mind for some reason because he's australian he's probably knows black hops too yep. i mean maybe even knows dan but yep. like he came out and he was like this is the coolest thing and James then shrimp co came to our last shrimp co i mean we've had countless number of people that have yeah flown for an event but because we have created this thing alongside that it's an interesting fun thing it's ours we i don't know it's just like we created this, a place for people to go we just we, like with during these these events i think in the evening time when all the speaking is over people are kind of going ah what should we go do what tonight now? where should yeah. we go should we all meet for dinner well we're giving them that place to go hang out where you know your crew is going to be mm-hmm. um but it's mm. sort of a, a change of subject, but like thinking of like what he was mapping out here, a lot of times I think about, okay, how can I apply this to my business, which, you know, we know is the podcast affiliate marketing, info marketing business. But then I also think, okay, what I was just learning here, how would I apply that to like a shutter company, for instance, right? So I've, I've random eight, example, I random why. example, you and I have both sort of <laughs> dealt with like fun businesses, like mm-hmm. talking to people and drinking beer and making beer and all the cool shit that somehow is how we make money these days um but we've also dealt with this like shutter company type business which when i say like a boring business i mean shutters aren't that freaking exciting manufacturing company i mean you can just say that yeah it's not that exciting sounding (laughs) so like based on what he was saying i would go okay well how would i apply this to like a shutter company Mm -hmm. well if we built a blog for that my 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 dad's shutter company right if we built a blog i can start making things about like you know what size windows can shutters go on you know what colors can you paint shutters what crazy shutters well, can uh, you make yeah, <laughs> designs like, ba- basically i would like do all the keyword research find all of the common questions that people are asking about shutters and i would make sure that my website our shutter company website mm-hmm. is the website that shows up for like every possible question you can think about sure. shutters and what's that going to do well they may not be ready to buy shutters the moment they find the content, but when they are ready to buy shutters, who's going to be there waiting? Your top you know? of mind. Yeah. You might not be making the sale from the get go, but at least you're in their minds because yep. you're the only one showing up doing that kind of thing. Yeah. And I mean, like, like the sort of unsexy businesses like that, most of them put no effort, mm. zero, none whatsoever into content marketing. Here's another one is like, what if you built a community on the back of a shutter company, mm. but not branded as a shutter company branded as like, you know, shutter custom oh, cooler name, but basically it'd be a group of people who own shutters already in their homes. So it's like, I don't know. It's just this community where it's like, I don't know. You, you, there's probably some weird shit with shutters. I don't know. <laughs> like I'm looking at them. You have them installed right in front of me here. Yeah. But like, I just don't know. I, I don't know if I've heard too work. many people bonding <laughs> over shutters. No, I know. Maybe that's a dumb idea. But there's probably some mm-hmm. community element that, again, staying top of mind. But I think at the end of the day, like what Dan was saying, it's stories. It's your brand. Yeah. So however you plant that into people's minds. Is well, just really thinking about shutters, work. right? Like you've been in the fa- like the shutter factories, mm-hmm. right? Like, it seems like a pretty boring industry, but when you get back into the factory, there's like really cool. kind of cool machinery and equipment and like automations that are happening that like most people have no idea that's what goes into making this stuff. Yeah. If you just like show them your world, people will be interested in it. The interesting thing, and this is where it relates to brewery mm-hmm. as well. The interesting thing is the making of the shutters, mm-hmm. the making of the beer, mm-hmm. and also uh for shutters i remember going out and installing some shutters or at least like i would observe and kind of help out mm-hmm. and i'm like this is actually really cool because it's now it's kind of like this woodworking has been done but now you have to customize it to this unique thing mm-hmm. in someone's house that's probably like a mansion because there were some baller homes what if you had behind the scene videos for all that stuff yeah it's just like breweries like you know you have the brewing thing which actually our first overtime i remember filming a video and editing one haha, behind the scenes video. And we use that as a sales material to get people to our event. Yeah. You could do the same damn thing with shutters. I like, shot a time lapse of the entire brewing process too. We've done multiple yeah. and like we always document it and there's a reason we live stream all that stuff, but shutters like what's to say you can't do the same damn thing. Just document the whole thing. ABC always be continent in con- continent in contenting. Always be contenting. Ooh. ABC. I think that's going to catch on. It's totally because right. contenting like is that. an easy word to say. Contenting. Contenting. It almost, sound, it almost sounds like incontinence. <laughs> it does. I know. Always I be that's incontinent. Getting... Mm, maybe not. No. 
I'm let's, gonna pass. Let's just Joe's daily life. Ooh. But I'm, psh, no. Ooh. Always uh, be contenting. I guess you could always say always be creating. That might flow better, but too many people have said that though. Oh. You're not unique. Oh. Your USP is contenting. Okay. I like contenting better <laughs> just because go. it's so stupid. Hashtag always be contenting. <laughs> always be contenting. <laughs> All right. Let's wrap this thing up. Dan was amazing. You need to get his book. It's on Amazon. It's very inexpensive. I don't know. I, I It's actually on the... I mean, just get the dang thing because here's the thing. It's... <laughs> I'm just laughing because he literally told people to Google oh, it yeah. and download it That's if you right. find it. <laughs> yeah, don't do that. But if you come across it, I guess there's good quality versions out there. <laughs> He's checked. But um, I love it because it distills everything we just talked about, but in a very linear process. Compound marketing is the title. Mm-hmm. And um, and literally on like page one, he was like, I ain't got anything to sell you. I don't need to. Well, that's what's great about and it. Lets your, it I think it puts the reader's guard down because you're like, oh, I get the full picture of this thing. So if you like this interview, get that book. My Compound favorite marketing. guests are the ones that come on. And before we hit record, they're like, I don't have anything to sell. Perfect. Because whenever we know they have nothing to sell, we know that they will literally open up about any question we ask. Right. Yeah. And and Dan was, was like that. He's like, mm-hmm. I got nothing to sell. You know, like you can point them at my brewery, point them at my book, but. Mm-hmm. Shit. He even said Google it and you might even find the PDF. Support the dude. I Support mean him. me personally, I don't even like digital books. I prefer print. <laughs> um but uh yeah. Well hey, I mean, get that. Um also if you're in Australia, go check out Black Hops or at least order their stuff online. I think they ship in Australia. Mm-hmm. Uh and I know a lot of y'all are in Australia. Mm-hmm. So I would love, love, love to hear if you're talking got some- to you, Chris. Yeah, Chris. Talking to you. James, James. Hey. and Mike, Mike and uh, Charlie, uh huh, Ilana, Ilana, yep, uh, Charlie, uh, uh, Salome, uh, uh, Gert is Gert in Australia? Um, no, he is not. He is on the opposite side of the world. Okay, he's in Europe. Um, <laughs> so you can't get it, Gert. Sorry, we, have, we can go down the list of all of our customers in Australia. I'm sorry, we forgot some of your names, but uh, I was just like thinking of guests from Australia. <laughs> That's true. We have a lot. Um. But tag us, tag us and them. I'm super curious because I want to, I really just want to know what that tastes like because I've never yeah. tasted any of it. So for some reason, when, I, when I picture for us black hops, I always assume it's going to be like a stout or like a porter, like a black beer, but I know that's not true. <laughs> I think he started with uh, something. I for, yeah, I don't know. I forget what their first beer was, but I thought it was maybe. I don't know. I'm not going to butcher that. But I will tell way. you that next time we're in Australia, we're going to stop by. Yeah. All right. Well, I want to see y'all stopping by there and let it and just guilt us because we will, it'll force us to get out to Australia a little faster. <laughs> yeah. And when you get to the brewery, tell the people behind the counter, oh, I heard about this on oh, Hustle and Flowchart. Yeah, Dan was spitting some cool stuff out there on the Hustle Flowchart podcast. Yeah. All right. Cool. So, um, yeah, give us some FOMO and post that. <laughs> so, uh, also get the notes. Yeah. You know, we have action guides on this whole episode here, of course. So, two weeks of this going live. It is free, but uh, after that, it goes into our paid vault area. It's not that expensive to get in there. But Mm -hmm. if you go to flowchartgroup.com, you will uh, actually get access to our Facebook group and the notes, the action guide to this episode. So make sure to plug in your email address at flowchartgroup.com. And also, we are sponsored by our wonderful buddies, our friends, the webinar friends of ours. Mm -hmm. Who are they they again? Tell me about um, them. They're called... Weezy Ebinar. Weezy Ebinar. We so Weezy. No, we're easy. (laughs) Easy Webinar is uh, is the tool. So everything webinar that you can possibly think of doing in webinar formats and things that you've never thought of that webinars are capable of doing, they can do. (laughs) All in one platform. Except for what you're thinking. Don't go there. Yeah, that's not worth pursuing. I would I would scratch that idea. Yeah. So uh, stick with. Uh, easy webinar will give you enough ideas keep your you, clothes on is what we're saying <laughs> well at least keep the camera a little higher than it is now. i guess it depends on your model there's a lot of people making a lot of money taking their clothes off i'm not going to tell you what to do and not to do <laughs> <laughs> you know that's your decision so um unless easy webinar is going to slap you for two i'm uh, i haven't read the terms on that side yeah well easy so. webinar they're hooking you up anyway they're going to give you a discount because you listen to hustle and flow chart mm-hmm. so if you go to easywebinar.com slash hustle that's where the hookup is happening yep. so easywebinar.com slash hustle it's what we use when we use webinars. It's what you should use when you do webinars. Easywebinar.com slash hustle. hustle. And if you've enjoyed this episode and if you've hung out 
20 minutes during this banter section. <laughs> go share this with some folks and go uh, subscribe, rate, and review. Tell us if you love this episode and, and tell a friend. And don't Please. forget, ABC, always be content and content. <laughs> Bye, y'all. Thanks, everybody, for listening to this episode of the Hustle and Flowchart podcast. For taking the time to listen, we want to give you something a little bit special. Every single episode that we do, we actually have somebody on our team take notes. We basically have a Cliff's Notes version of every episode where you can go and find all of the tips and tactics that they laid out, all of the resources that they laid out, all the good stuff from this episode. We actually have a nice, simple notes version that you can find on our website. So go to evergreenprofits.com. Find this episode that you just listened to and uh, give us your email address and we'll send you the notes. 